Loving God, I thank you for this day, for this place, for all those present here or tuning in. I thank you for your word to us and your presence with us. Amen. Amen. So here again we have the central statement of Mark. Jesus says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And as I've said before, this is the point. And Mark's gospel reads as though he is in a hurry to get to this point. Because then the narrative is going to slow down and we're going to start to get more details about the different stories. But he won't quite skip over a few key episodes in Jesus's journey. He just lists them off like a checklist of major spiritual events. Baptism, check. Receiving the Holy Spirit, check. Being claimed as the beloved child of God, check being whisked, actually the, te the text says, being cast out into the desert wilderness to be tempted by Satan, check. That gets one line. Finding their wild animals and ministering angels, losing his cousin John, first to imprisonment and then to execution. Are you breathless? Does your life seem busy or overwhelming sometimes? Mark does mention that the time in the wilderness is 40 days. But stop and think about all that he just crammed into this very brief text. And then Mark gives us this announcement. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. And there are two things to notice that I want to highlight about this pronouncement. The first is, who is speaking? That matters, right? Why should we listen? Does this person have the authority to make this pronouncement, and what is the background? The second is to notice the presence of the divine with Jesus during this whole crazy whirlwind run-up to this stunning pronouncement, right? We have had 2,000 years to get used to this amazing thing that God does in the world. At one point, it was news. It is still good news, but it is easy to forget what a stunning pronouncement it was. And notice that we're starting our reading here in chapter 1, verse 9 of Mark's Gospel. So we've got like nothing in the way of run-up. We've got no genealogy. We've got no miraculous birth story. And Mark is thought to have been the first of the Gospels to be authored. So Mark's hearers didn't have Matthew to go read, to fill in some of the missing details. They didn't have Luke. They didn't have John. The text assumes we know things they would have known. Right? When you hear that number 40, that he's in the wilderness for 40 days, what does that number 40 draw for you? What else is 40 days in scripture? I heard flood. What's 40 years? The wilderness, the exodus, right? Always, always assume that somewhere in the subtext of what you're reading is the exodus. It, it might not be all the time, but like it's a very good starting point. Um, yeah, 
Uh, Elijah was 40 days. Moses was 40 days on the mountain. Lots of these touch point stories are connected to 40. Now, when you hear wild animals in temptation, what does that pull? Adam in Eden with wild animals and temptation, right? And, it, and, and, and if you read the Apostle Paul, of course, he tells you that one way of thinking about Jesus is as the new Adam, right? That faces temptation with more success. Uh, so they would also have known Isaiah 11 that describes the coming of the shoot of Jesse and the holy mountain of God where all of God's creatures can exist in peace together. They would know Psalm 91 that talks about guarding angels. Reads Psalm 91 sometime, y'all. It, it literally talks about God protecting us from stubbing our toe or tripping over ourselves, tripping over the rocks at our feet. I love that imagery with God's angels. So Mark is using shorthand. Right, with these stories that are meant to be so familiar that just a quick reference will bring them to mind. And so with a remarkable economy of words, he can walk Jesus through these very important events and in the process connect Jesus to the ongoing work of God in the history of God's people, right? Who is making this pronouncement? Jesus. Jesus is making this pronouncement on what authority? On this connection to what God is doing, right? That question of authority would have is, is first of all central in the gospel, right? As you read Mark's gospel, you can just assume that everyone he meets is asking themselves those questions. Who is this person? Does he have the authority to make these pronouncements? And how do I respond? And that is our question also, right? Will I repent and believe in the good news? Will I live as a follower of Jesus in this messy world? Which brings me to my second point. At the baptism of Jesus, the Holy Spirit descends. A divine presence with Jesus. And we hear the voice of God claiming Jesus as God's beloved child. And Jesus finds himself tempted in the wilderness, but ministered to by angels. And in these intense experiences, the divine is amazingly consistent in being present, particularly when you consider how little else we actually know from this text, right? We get very scant details. We do not have Jesus' thoughts while all of this is going on. Jesus was human. I would venture to guess that it was not as simple or easy as a quick reading of these sentences would make it. Right? Jesus, in these intense spiritual moments, in these challenging times, wild animals and temptation, uh, is accompanied by the divine, the voice of God, the spirit of God, the angels of God. And incidentally, 
that the Greek, when it talks about the angels ministering to Jesus, when we read about Simon's mother-in-law being healed and then getting up and serving Jesus, same word. Same word. It's the word from which we get our word deacon. Right? This is deeply embedded in our faith. That to be faithful is to serve Jesus. And I think in this world, sometimes angels show up as the sturdy and hardworking humans who go the extra mile for us. Right? So when we find that our life is a little bit too much wilderness, feels a little bit like too many wild animals or just a bit too much temptation. It's worth remembering that we also are the beloved children of God, that we also are guided by the Holy Spirit and occasionally ministered to by angels. The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God has come near. Will you repent and believe in the good news? This week on Wednesday, we marked the beginning of Lent, which is a season of preparation for Easter. Traditionally, Easter was a time for baptisms, or in other words, a time in which people made this decision to turn their lives over to Christ. And so this is a season in which we reorient ourselves to what it means to live in a messy world as followers of Christ. And our Lenten spiritual disciplines often have to do with either giving something up or adding something. And I want to suggest instead that our world is so intense right now that it is moving at such a pace that maybe the invitation is just to slow down and reflect and notice the changes that have already happened in our lives, either personally or in our larger communities. Because it wouldn't surprise me if we haven't quite come to terms with all that has happened. If, like Mark, we haven't been telling our lives stories at warp speed so that we don't even really have time to reckon with some of the very important things that have been happening to and among us. So that is my invitation. Uh, and as you are prayerfully considering what you might need to let go of as a result of those changes in all of our lives, there's paper in Founders Hall you can also use a little piece of paper of your own. It doesn't, it doesn't particularly matter. Uh, but just jot down what it is that you're letting go of and fold it up. Uh, and if you want, somebody can make it into pretty origami, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, and we'll just attach it to our letting go tree that we have here. And then over the course of Lent, those will drop out of the tree and make their way into the Easter vigil fire so that we can let them go and be ready for whatever it is that Christ is calling us to next. Amen.